This week we're talking about being happy. What does the Bible say about being happy? And I think being happy is one of those things where you look at your life and you look at your, your background, your family history, you look at your mental health history, and you're like, do I have what it takes to be happy? Can I be someone that is happy? Uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, it was like graduation season. Uh, anybody in the room go to a graduation? People, a lot of grad, any graduates? Anybody graduate from, yeah, let's give it up. Some people graduated from, from some stuff. Yeah. I remember my graduation, I was like so nervous. I, I'm not like a normally anxious or nervous person, um, but it was one of those things that like whatever it was about graduation just made me nervous. I, I remember I graduated from Missouri State a long time ago, and um, whenever I was like getting close, like March and April, I remember like waking up in the middle of the night and doing a degree audit. Do they still have degree audits where you'd like, you go in, yeah, some people cheering for, for making sure you're going to graduate. You, you live the same anxious life that I did. Uh, but I would like wake up at like 2 or 3 a.m. and like open my computer and, and like check. And when you, when you go through, it just has the list of everything that you need to graduate all the things that you have done are green, that are finished. All the things that are in process are yellow. And all the things that aren't done and aren't qualified by the end of this semester are in red. So, like, I was last semester, like, I remember meeting with my advisor halfway through, and I'm like, I, I need everything to be yellow. Like, there's no red on here, right? And I, at the beginning of the semester, there was, like, a red thing. And I was like, I've done this. Like, I need to know that I'm going to graduate, right? Like, I need to know this. And I'd wake up in the middle of the night super nervous. So I was looking forward to graduation because in my mind, once I got that uh, degree, once I got that piece of paper, th they can't take it back. So I was like, graduation is, like, the day. So you get to graduation. You wear the cap and gown. Um, you, you, you end up in Missouri State's like underground tunnel system and uh, you get a, a card with your name on it with the phonetic like pronunciation of your name. Corey Johnson sat next to me even though he wasn't in the same college as I was, uh, fun fact. Uh, super fun. But you walk on stage and I just remember the like, I was a little nervous like, they're going to want, I'm going to walk on stage, they're going to say my name, they're going to present me with the degree, which by the way, you get your like thing, there's nothing in it. They don't give you the, the degree yet, so the graduation doesn't even really necessarily matter. And I remember like shaking somebody's hand. I don't even remember whose hand I shook. I think I blacked most of it out. But I remember walking across the stage and then like coming back and sitting in the seat and being like, that was it? Like all that anxiety, all that worry, all that like work that I put in, all those sleepless nights, all that homework, all the assignments, all that for like nothing. And I remember like thinking like, I thought this was like going to make me happy. I thought this was going to be like the thing. So after graduation, I was like, okay, maybe it's the job. Maybe it's the next thing. Maybe it's one. And I just remember it's like, and, and maybe for you, it's something else. I remember having the same feeling whenever I was 16 and I learned to drive and I got my license and I got a job and I paid for my own insurance. And I was like, okay, now everything's going to kind of click and now I'll be happy. Now life will kind of start to make sense. And it didn't. And the thing for me with graduation that made it even a little less uh, meaningful like a year or two after I graduated, there was this comedian that was in Springfield that snuck in to Springfield's gra to uh, Missouri State's graduation, bought a cap and gown, found his own card, and they just like walked him across the stage with no work. No and it was like, wow, that literally means nothing to anyone. And to me, it meant so much. And, and, and to me, I just, happiness is such a moving target. Happiness is such a moving target. It's hard to hit. It's hard to be like, okay, why did I wake up happy today, but I wasn't happy yesterday? Your feelings are such a spectrum. It's such a hard thing to nail down, okay, why do I feel this way today? And any, like, research that you look at, anything that they're trying to, like, okay, what makes someone happy? How can we, like, scientifically nail down how, do, how are people happy? Uh, this article that I read that was a Gallup poll says that it's a subjective well-being. You know what subjective is? That's subjective to you. Objective is the same to everyone. Subjective is the, only to you. So your subjective well-being is built off of your perception of a situation. It's based, based off your perception of reality. It, it, it's subjective to you. So being happy is such a moving target. You're happy in one season. You're not happy in another season. You're happy in one job. You're not happy in another. So what is happiness, and can we attain it? So that Gallup poll that I looked at, just so you know, the Gallup poll that I looked at said that in 2020, 48% of people said that they were somewhat satisfied with their level of happiness. In 2022, that went down to 41%. So 7% in two years, and that means that everybody below that 41% is not happy. That means that everybody below that is not okay with things. That's sad. 
there's people that need to be happy. There's people that need to be joy-filled. So what does the Bible say about happiness? So we're going to read the Bible just a little bit tonight. And if you have your phone, you can look at the Bible app, go to events, and you've got all the verses right there. It's really easy to find. Uh, but we're going to read a couple verses just to start. And I want to ask this question as we're reading this verses. Do I really believe God in these areas? Do I really believe God in these areas? Matthew 16, 24 through 25 says this. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And some people read that and that's where they end it. And they're like, man, Christianity is all about like hoofing it, grinding, working hard, like take up your cross. You get, that's, that's all it is. But it doesn't stop there. It says in verse 25, for whoever would save his life will lose it. So if you try to just make life work for yourself, you're going to lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. That's the part of this kind of upside down, backwards economy that God runs in his kingdom of like, listen, if you want to find your life, you have to give it away. John 10, 10, we read this all the time. Logan and I, I feel like we say this all the time. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come, this is Jesus speaking, that they may have life and have it abundantly. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God came, that Jesus came so that you could not just have life, not just eternal life, but that you could have life abundant, meaningful wholesome, good life that means something, that is abundant. That's God's word. Jesus said that, that you might have abundant life. That's what God's word says. Philippians 4, 11 through 13. This is the last one we'll read before we kind of dive in. For I have learned, this is Paul talking, and he's talking about, this is that famous passage on peace. And then he talks about contentment. So he says, for I've learned in whatever situation I am is to be content, to be content. Most of the things that I read about happiness that are in scientific journals or research, they talk about what is happiness. It's contentment, it's fulfillment, and it's satisfaction. Even though it's a moving target, it's contentment, it's fulfillment, it's satisfaction. What do you get contentment out of? What do you get satisfaction out of? What do you get fulfillment out of? This is what he said. He said, I've learned that in whatever situation, I've learned to be content. Now, I don't know about you, but in most situations, I can find something to not be content about. I think today I said something to the tune of, like, I like to have something to complain about. So if something doesn't go my way, I can, like, ah, I've got something to be, to whine about a little bit. It feels nice. But he said, I've got, in whatever situation, I can be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to be abound. And in every circumstance, I've learned the secret of, place, of facing plenty and facing hunger, abundance and in need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So that's the verse I want to look at tonight. What's the secret of facing plenty, of facing hunger, an abundance and need in every circumstance, how to be brought low, how to abound, and to be content? Because I think contentment is something that is not found in our generation, in this generation. I think being okay with whatever circumstance is something that people don't find all over. If you're not happy, leave your spouse. If you're not happy, leave your job. If you're not happy, find a new car. If you're not happy, spend a little money on that credit card. Get whatever it is that you think is going to make you happy. Serve yourself. Do whatever you think is going to make you happy. But Paul's here like, man, I, I've learned the secret. I can do anything through Christ who gives me strength. So how do we go to God in everything so that we can have that contentedness. I have three things to check, three things to check. The first one is check your hunger. Check your hunger. Your mind, your body, and your soul crave what they've been fed. You know that? Like, there are things that you're feeding yourself consistently. Your body starts to go, hey, you should be reminded. You, you need more of that. Your mind does that. The things that you read, the things that you intake, the things that you listen to, the things that you watch, your body starts to, the, the dopamine, the serotonin, the things that happen in your mind whenever you have these ups and downs while you're watching a TV show, while you're doing something, those are things that your body is telling you that you need. And our soul works the same way. We're feeding ourselves. What you are listening to, what you are watching, what you are seeing on your phone, the podcasts that you listen to, the books that you read, all of that is a hunger that you are creating in yourself. Over and over and over. What's your hunger? What are you creating in yourself? Galatians tells us to walk by the Spirit. And when we walk by the Spirit, we won't satisfy the desires of the flesh. And then it goes on to say that these are two opposing things. And you're like, okay, but I have these desires that are just like, 
my flesh needs. I mean, it's not just talking about like your physical needs. It's saying like your personhood, who you are at your deepest soul is broken. It needs help. The Bible says that we're all broken, that we need help. And if we just dive into that, which a lot of culture will say is okay right now, Pastor Eddie always says we live in a culture that baits us to the edge and then chastises us for going off because we say, hey, do whatever makes you happy. And then when it gets really bad, we're like, well, we don't do it that much. And we kind of laugh about it, but it's like, hey, you should have as much sex as you want. Well, don't get anybody pregnant. Hey, you should eat whatever makes you happy, but don't get too big. Hey, you should do whatever makes you happy, but don't go in that much debt. We have this attitude that's like, whatever makes you happy, do it. And it's kind of on you, but the Bible says that these things oppose each other. And it's like, why, why do we have these oppositions within ourselves? If we're wanting to try to follow God, why is it that our flesh opposes each other? Philippians 4, 8, and 9, right before what I read earlier, it says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. It's telling you. Romans 12, 1 and 2 talks about the transformation of your mind and your soul and your spirit. How? By changing what you intake. What's your input? Then it says in verse 9, what you've learned and received and seen in me, practice these things, and the peace of God will be with you. There's peace that's available, but we have to practice, and we have to think. We can't just ingest and, and, and take in whatever we want and go, I don't understand why I'm not happy. It's telling us right here. It's telling us why we don't have peace, why we don't have contentment. Colossians 3, 1 and 2 says something similar. It says, then if you've been raised with Christ, he's speaking to Christians. He says, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on the things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. There's this attitude that's like, man, if you want to grow, if you want to be a person of God, seek things of God. Set your mind on those things. That means think about them throughout the day. Practice those things. Those are the practical things that we have to hunger for. And I think we have to look at it like, man, how do you even start? The Bible talks about it like the, the, the spiritual milk, just starting with the very basics. Logan talked about a reading plan earlier today. And it's like, man, that Bible app that you can look at notes in has something that you can just read a couple verses a day. It'll even read it to you if you don't like physically reading it. It's fantastic. I do these all the time because I need the help. I need to retrain my body, my mind, and my soul around what I'm hungering. The second thing is to check your habits. So check your hunger and check your habits. What are you doing? What are the practical things that you're doing? What are you showing up to? What are the things that are happening with your mind, your body, your spirit, your soul that you're doing? If you look at the book of Proverbs, I was just reading through Proverbs a little bit today to like look at these and see the things. That is a, a impartial good book to read if you want your life to be better. Like, do you know that you could just look at it and do it apart from the rest of the Bible and your life will probably be better? Because it says, th- I mean, it talks about anything, everything from relationships, conflict, debt, marriage, who to find to date. Like, it talks about so many different things that's like, if you just read the book, the book of Proverbs and did what it said, your life would be better and you'd probably be happier. While we know that we are not the sum of our decisions, that God will define us in our identity and who we are, we still deal with the consequences of our decisions. If I went and drove my car in the middle of 65 and stopped it going sideways the wrong way, there are consequences to that decision, right? There are consequences to everything that we do. Now, that maybe doesn't change where my soul resides with God, but there are consequences to all those things. And we can't just let that go. We can't just let that slide. There's things in the Bible that it talks about. There's integrity in relationships, in money, in, in conflict resolution, with our words and speech. There's a God-prescribed life that has to do with investing in others, serving, giving, rest, confession. And there are ways that people will take some of those aspects outside of the Bible and say, hey, it works here. If you ever look at AA, if you ever look at Alcoholics Anonymous, they take a lot of what being a Christian is without the God part, and they go, man, it's about confession. It's about community. It's about acknowledging that you need help. You know why some of that practically works? Because it's what the Bible says to do. There's pieces of it that just kind of work because... That's God's prescription. And some of the the simplest things, some of the times we get to talk to people, it's like, man, this has been going on in my life. Okay, have you read what the Bible has to say about that and done it? 
There's some simplicity to it that I think is really good. I, I think you're probably in the room, you're probably 18 to 30 something. And you might look at the problems that you have now and you're like, okay, are they really that big of a deal? Play it out to your 50, play it out to your 60, play it out to when you have children and grandchildren and the things that you're doing now, are they things that you wanna be passing down to those children and grandchildren? Have a long vision for your life and the, the lives of the people around you. How does it change? How does it grow? How does it, that's how you start to build happiness. That's how you start to build a life filled with joy. Psalm 1, 1 through 4 says, or 1 through 3 says this, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in all he does, he prospers. There's this attitude that, man, if you just plant yourself by the word of God, you'll be pretty good you'll be pretty good. And I think there's something to this simple obedience of doing what God has to say that will not bring you just happiness, won't bring you just the contentment, fulfillment, satisfaction, because those have to do with our emotions, and that's such a moving target. And, and in Jeremiah, it says that our heart is deceitful. So my heart will tell me I need one thing, and then it'll move the goalpost on me. It'll tell me I want something, and then I get it, and it's like, ah, it wasn't really what I wanted. But if I plant myself there, I'll be like a tree planted by water that gives me life. So check your hunger. The third thing is to check your hope, to check your hope. Psalm 51 is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, and it talks about how David kind of returned to the Lord after this big sin that he had. And one of the phrases that he uses in there is he asks God, will you restore to me the joy of salvation? Will you restore to me the joy of salvation? Joy is something that we get to live with. It's one of the fruit of the Spirit. It's one of the things that doesn't have to leave us. Regardless of circumstance, we can be content. Why? Because God gives us joy that is not, not based on our circumstances. That he'll restore to you the joy of your salvation. What does that mean? That means that you can rest in the identity, rest in the fact that I know where my soul is going to reside. This may not be okay for this moment. I might have to deal with the consequences of my decision, but me and the person who created me were good. And that's where you have to look into it and go, okay, if God really is who he says he is and he's the source of all good and he knows me and he created me and he's telling me no on this thing right now, I have to trust that it's the best for me because he loves me. He loves me more than anybody else. He's not just, it's not this like half in like, hey, I just want you to be, to be satisfied because I, I have children and they're satisfied if they have a snack at all times, but that's not what's best for them. My, my kids were sick a couple weeks ago, so we were just like, we're doing some, some loose, lazy parenting, I'll be honest. And we're just like, let, let's, just let them, let's just let them watch TV, they're resting, and our, our son Riggins is two and a half, and he will find, he was here with us last week, he will find any one of you and ask you to open a popsicle. He'll look at the, most, the person he thinks is the most weak and go, hey, will you open this snack for me? And I've already told him no, and it's like, okay, well, it's fine. I came home that day that my kids were sick, and I was like, hey, how are the boys? And she was like, good. Riggs didn't eat any meals, but he ate seven granola bars. It's like, okay, all right. That's just the way it is. But it's like he, he was just filling himself with whatever it is that he wanted, and he thought that was going to give him life and was going to give him goodness. and what's good. Like we, we need to, to bed down and get what God knows is best for us, even when we don't see it even when the people around us don't see it, because God said no, or God said yes to a situation that didn't make sense. God loves us, and he lets us go through things sometimes that don't make any sense because he knows us best. I'm going to read two verses that are, that are hard but are good. Isaiah 43, 1 and 2 says, But now thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed you, and I have called you by name, and you are mine. I mean, he does this. This is who you are. But then he mimics what Paul says earlier. He says, so when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. There's going to be hard times. I mean, if you guys are young adults, you've already seen hard stuff. You've had pain, you've had difficulty, you've had loss, you've had things that aren't awesome. But what's true about this is that who you are has not changed. If you know Christ, that's available to you. If you are 
a Christian, he's with you, even in the hard time, even in the difficult places. He's not left you right there with you. And then Revelation 21, 3 and 4. This is the end of the book. This is the promise that God gives. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. That's the reality is that the things of this life are going to pass away. There's nothing that you can save. There's nothing that you can do that will bring you joy for the rest of your life. That's just the reality. And that's not fun to listen to. This life is going to pass away. But we have a God that is coming back. We have a God that is good. We have a God that brings hope. We have a God that brings life and life abundant. That's why Paul could look at his situation. Paul had one of the craziest stories where he was shipwrecked, snake bitten, beaten. And he looked at it like, listen, highs and lows, I'm good. Why could he say that? Because he had this hope. He had this, this thing that lived inside of him where he was just like, I'm good. Me and the person who created me, I'm good with him. So I can live with whatever circumstance because I have that hope. So I want to end tonight and ask, do you have that hope? Are you putting that hope in something else? In something that will pass away? Because I think that Christianity, more than anything else, we can live with joy. But that also means that we can enjoy good things in their proper place. I'm not expecting a meal, a weekend away, a vacation, an experience to give me joy. Because I know it can make me happy, but God is the only thing that can give me joy. So it lets me put that in its proper place and go, God lets me enjoy that. And that is good. And now I go back to God for that joy. I always have that. Happiness can come and go, but joy that lives down deep in your heart will never, ever leave you if you know Christ. Do you have that? I want to tell you a story about my friend Tim. Back when I was in high school in St. Louis, I had a good group of friends from church, and we were all close. And um, these guys went to this school a little bit further north than I was. And all of a sudden, this guy started coming around named Tim. And I didn't know much about Tim. Tim was from a really good family. Um, his grandfather was, um, owned one of the biggest car dealerships in St. Louis. So his family was wealthy. They had everything they needed. They had the right last name. Um, he was athletic. He, he played multiple sports at his school, was really good at them. He was part of the party scene. I mean, he had everything that you would want in high school if you would say, like, this is the high school experience. He received it. But he started coming around our group of friends, and I finally had to ask him, like, Tim, where'd you come from? Like, where, what's going on here? And he was like, man, I was part of the party scene at my school. And he was like, I realized in a bad moment something. I'll tell you what that is. He said that he had drank himself into a blackout at a party. And all these people left him. And he was outside. He woke up in a place where he didn't know. He was basically woke up in a gutter. And he was like, these people left me for dead. And he was like, here, I thought I had the best friends. I thought I had the most money. I thought I had the best experience. And he was like, these people didn't love me. These people didn't care for me. They essentially left me for dead. And he was like, so I, I realized I needed new friends. That's where things started with him. But Tim grew up Catholic. Tim grew up believing that all you had to do was show up, go to church, do a couple of things, and you were good with God. He started coming to church with us, and he realized that God was a person who wanted a relationship with him, who loved him. And looked at his sin and didn't just say, okay, say a couple Hail Marys. He said, hey, listen, I have died on the cross for you so that you can have a new life, so that you can be made new, so that you can be content and have joy in every circumstance. And Tim was like, I, this was different from the religion that I understood. And he said, I want that. And Tim gave his life to Christ. And Tim didn't find his satisfaction in a new group of friends that cared about him better. Tim didn't find his satisfaction in a better party and more things. Tim found his satisfaction in Christ because he knew that God cared for him. Have you done that? Because I think it's even easy as a Christian to kind of have a foot in both camps and go, okay, I, I love God. But I also love the things that are here that what we read in Revelation is going to pass away. And what if your life looked like wholly selling out to God so that you could say, man, I'm all about God. My life is hidden with him in Christ. I'm chasing after him. I'm hungering. I'm inhabiting. I'm, I'm, my hope is in him. Everything about your life is for God. That's where joy comes from. That's where true contentment comes from. Will you guys bow your heads? I'm going to pray. Before I pray, I just want to ask a question. If you're here and you'd say, I don't have that hope and I want that, 
Will you just lift your hand up? I don't have that hope and I know I need it. I know I need that hope. Will you just lift your hand up? Here's the thing. What the Bible says is that that is an offer that's given to you. It's a gift. And with any gift, you just have to receive it. So here's what receiving that gift looked like to me when I was six years old and I received it. I knew I didn't know much about Christian faith. I didn't know much about God. I didn't even know that much about myself, but I knew that I was broken and I had done bad things and I needed God to come in and fix those things. I couldn't do it myself. So I prayed that to God. I said, God, I'm messed up. I don't have everything figured out. God, I need you because of what Jesus did on the cross to come in and forgive, to save me. And he did. That's what accepting that gift looks like. So I'm going to pray a prayer that sounds a lot like that. And if you, you'd say, man, I need to give my life to Christ. Our team at Next Steps right after this would love to celebrate with you. You can even just grab a connection card and fill it out. You don't have to say anything. And somebody from our team will call or text you this week just to help answer questions and celebrate with you. But I'm going to pray that prayer. And, and if you're interested, if you know that you need that, you should pray it to God too. I pray like this, God, I'm broken. And I know that what I bring to the table is a bad attitude, selfishness, pride, anger, lust, resentment. But God, I need you to come in and save me of those things. I need you to come in and make me new. So God, right now with open arms, I'm just saying, come in. Make me new. Give me hope. Give me joy. Give me peace. Because only you can do that. I want the peace that you offer, God. Come in and be the Lord, be the most important, be the most in charge of my life, and make me new, God. We love you. We thank you in your holy name. Amen.